Okay. Well, thanks, thanks for showing up. This is a different feel in this room. Uh, but uh, so today we're going to talk about IRBs, institutional review boards, and uh, Dr. Bowie and Warren Copley, uh, who uh, recently went through it uh, for her dissertation work, are going to speak about it as well as uh, because of some emails back and forth, uh, Dr. Bowie invited. Uh, Actually, kind of at my request, uh, given all the emails, um, Leslie Rowan from the Office of Research also uh, come and speak and answer questions. Um, Reminder that two weeks from now, we're back in McClellan, and Aaron Rowland's going to talk about his dissertation, How Left, How Left to Turn, something like that, uh, in Latin America, um, talking about neoliberalism in several countries in Latin America. And in effect, although he doesn't have an interview lined up, I'm, I'm thinking of it as kind of a package job talk because he's on the market this year. So, um, we preview for that. Uh, oh, okay, here's my other thing for today. Um, I talked to 506 students yesterday uh, after sending out the email about the Office of Research running workshops on the NSF fellowship. And um, I think I'll, I'll just send this around. Uh, I want to gauge interest in an internal workshop uh, in our department. And this could be with, either with Diana Moyer, uh, who's moved to the Office of Research from the Center for the Study of Social Justice, uh, or with faculty in the department. So um, I put down your name. Uh, put down your name if you're interested. And the second column is if you plan to go to one of the workshops that the Office of Research is putting on for those NSF fellowships next week, uh, just so I have a sense. And the third column is if you're interested this semester, like you're going to be ready to have whatever level of draft, but some level of draft proposal, say, in the next six weeks that you would want a workshop and or have it. I mean, maybe you can put a comment if you're interested. The other thing we've done in the past is have workshops about how to write proposals in general. So uh, if you can maybe indicate whether you're ready, you'd like to be part of workshopping your proposal, or you just need general tips. Yeah. Um. Just about that workshop. Is there a date for that yet? There are two dates, and I didn't bring them. I didn't print them out, but uh, because nobody told me, so I don't have the registration forms ready for it yet. Diana Moyer, who's on our distribution list still for this colloquium, emailed me last night saying, "Thanks for forwarding this. I didn't see it." Uh, so Alan Rutenberg's name is at the bottom of yeah, this. Yeah, well, you have to notify me. I can look up my email a little while this is going on and check, but it's That's it's, okay. it's two dates done. next week. Yeah. <laughs> and and you're speaking all the time. It's like it's your workshop. No. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> Wednesday and Thursday. Look up the Wednesday and Thursday. Okay. Does everybody will have to register um, because we need information for who all goes to the workshops, like department and in advance. I will send you an email which you can send out. Just take a minute know. to register. Phoenix, was it in that email? Did you have to register? Was there a link in that one? I think so. Yeah, all right. So I'll, I'll check in a minute. Anyway, I'll, check I'll send you this out. back. Exactly. It seemed like, <laughs> Dr. Gallon, I wasn't sure what you like. You indicated in the email that this was for like a particular type of NSF grant, though, that would only be available for undergraduate students or master's students would have Yeah, so this, yes, down. that's correct. Right. This particular NSF grant uh, is a three year grant, and you cannot be any further than. Uh, the beginning of your second year of graduate. Right. There are other grants. Sure. Um, would it still be beneficial to you in any way? I mean, if you weren't in that. If you're thinking, of, if you're thinking about NSF, probably, it's, it's going uh, to go or any of the big national ones. Right. Uh, I'm sure they'll talk about specific rules for that, but uh, just kind of general things that are any NSF grant that talks about, which is uh, like your project significance and uh, impact. So it's not a bad thing if you're if you're getting ready to think about proposals uh, to, to do this. Oh. This column in general, like you're interested. Yeah, put that third one I think you could just divide it like you're interested in hearing about proposals or you're ready to workshop your own proposal. If you can subdivide that, that would be great. Yeah. Okay. Dr. Bowie, are you oh, yes. ready? Oh. So our, our plan one. for today uh, is that Dr. Bowie is going to talk about uh, 
IRBs in general, why, why do we have to apply to them, what they mean, um, what kinds of research are subject to what levels of IRB and so forth. Um, and then, then I think we're going to turn it over to Leslie Rowan to talk about uh, the, the UT procedures and protocols and any questions that people have about the, also the training because there, there used to be an online training here and now they've uh, as of August 1st, the website says it's been pushed off to this external training uh, site. And uh, and I think then, are you going third, Lauren? Is that still It's good? coming back to us. Yeah. Okay, yeah. come back yeah. to yeah. Right. That's what I thought. Right. Okay. I just wanted to confirm. To talk about, more specifically, about uh, forms and How to uh, um, experiences. And <laughs> think about your questions. I've already been pumping Dr. Boyd with questions about when do faculty have to do what uh, if their students are applying for things. So. Um, get your questions ready. Okay. Okay. Uh, thank you for coming to uh, that workshop. Uh, I have an idea to have that workshop based on my experience last year to review several of uh, the application for IRB. And so uh, I think that uh, it will be uh, a good idea to provide all of the researchers, you are researchers when you do research, and the new one. Uh, who some information about IRB procedure that we have at UT. And so uh, I, I talked with uh, Paul, and I think that uh, we are uh, subject to have a, the, the, the workshop or the talk about that issues. And so generally, I don't want to talk a lot because we have a lot of information on the website. Uh, I just talk about the main thing because I don't want to you know, make you sleep by talking you know, uh, about the information uh, already on, available on the web. And so basically, why do we need to have IRB? And so I believe that all of us in the research method course in undergraduate, uh, we already know that when we do research, we have to observe the ethics of research. And the ethics of research, mainly that when you participate or engage in the research, uh, you want to produce uh, knowledge to serve the society, but maybe unintentionally, uh, you can cause harm to the research subject, but you may not know. And so we have to think about the issues of fairness when you want to produce uh, or give, uh, do something good for the society at the expense of others, and that we should avoid. And that's the issue of research ethics, and generally our, our research can have in many areas, just like uh, uh, social science in our area, uh, natural science, or biomedical science. And research in generally indicate that the harm caused to the subject in our area is the lowest. We, in the past, we have not uh, many incidents to cause harm to the system to the research subject, but what kinds of harm that we can cause to them? Uh, in the R area, and you still can remember the material that we learned in the undergraduate method course. In biomedical, uh, they uh, tried the new um, uh, drugs on those who had no ability to make uh, the decision or agreement, just like they use the prisoners, uh, without their knowledge. Uh, they also, we have the incident of uh, Tuskegee uh, incident <coughs> where those who have a um, lack of authority to uh, make the decision have to uh, and have knowledge and in the research. And so uh, there's a many kind of harms that we can cause to research subject, just like a physical harms as we just indicate. Uh, in social science research, there's also the potential of physical harms. Uh, when we review information, we obtain from research subject to other people without their knowledge and without their agreement. And that's in the, the issues of domestic violence research when we interview a uh, bad woman and then we let her husband, their husband know that they talk with you about the issues. And that can create more problems in their family. Uh, and so that is an example. And besides physical harms, 
there's also the issue of psychological harm uh, when you talk with people about their past and sometimes you reveal something that very painful and make them feel very uncomfortable and I have that experience when we talk with uh, our former uh, prisoners, those on parole, uh, when we talk about their experience with arrest, incarceration, and so, you know, generally that the harm that we can cause to the research subject when we engage in research. And um, also the issues of privacy, and we know that uh, one of the basic thing in our society is that we protect um, privacy. <coughs> and when you interview people, you obtain information from them, uh, something private, and you may disclose that information to others that they may not want. <coughs> and uh, and that we need to make sure that when we, we engage in research, we will not cause physical harm, psychological harm, do not uh, disclose the privacy of other people, try to protect people's privacy. And that's all about the IRB, the human uh, research, uh, human protection. And so generally, because of that goal, the, uh, the human protection uh, only focus on how to protect uh, human research subject. And therefore, any research that uh, does not involve human subject will not uh, cover by the review. Okay? And so how do you know? And in order to do that, we have a two form, and we will discuss in, in more detail the form A for those who plan to use the secondary data that there's no way that you can identify the research subject. But there's other kind of secondary data that you may be able to identify the research subject that I use. Currently, I use the FL data. <coughs> And they have a all kind of uh, security measures that you have to follow very strict in order to access the data. Under this case, you still have to find the human subject because there's a potential that you can reveal and you know the person because you have the information. I think that one of the reasons because that's a representative sample and they collect the data based on sensor track and we know the sensor track and only one is a strap, sensor strap, there's about, sometimes there's a two, three, sometimes there's a 10 or more than 10 people selected. If it is only about two or three, maybe in some way, accidentally, you know the person who participate. And that's the reason they have a safe word to make sure that you have to follow all of the security measures not to let other people access the data, even though the data is considered secondary data and all of the case has a number rather than a name. And so the research that involves human subject will be under review. The research is identified, identifiable, private information will be under review, and research that is a secondary data where uh, the information about the identity of the research subject may be revealed. All of those should be under review, okay? And so, in terms of uh, protection, uh, the human subject protection focus on protect uh, those who have less power and those who are at risk. <coughs> and generally those who are at risk are those who have less power to express their view to the researchers, because sometimes you ask questions, some people are assertive, they don't want to answer the question, say no, I don't want to answer that question. But all the people who are less assertive may, you know, compel to answer the question. And so a number of those, if you are involved in this kind of research subject, prepare to have the full review. Children, okay, prisoners, uh, are those under correctional uh, supervision, uh, pregnant women, uh, minorities, uh, mentally disabled persons, <coughs> and economically and educationally disadvantaged persons. 
And if your research involves all of those subjects, prepare to have a full review. Okay? And so I stop here and I let Leslie talking about the organization of IRB uh, in UT because it, different universities can organize in a different way. So here we talk about UT, more concrete about UT. Yeah. You need to use a computer? Uh, no. Okay. No, that's okay. My computers were all locked up. <coughs> yeah. So y'all don't get to see my pretty little PowerPoint, but you got a copy of it. So um, there's a couple things here. I printed out from our compliance website a list of frequently asked questions that we've had a lot of students ask um, over the past couple years. So you might want to just this might answer some of your questions. Um, if not, bring is awesome. Um, if anybody did not get a handout, if you'll give me your name and email address, I'll send it to you. Um, I broke both copiers, so I didn't get enough copies. Um, what I have to talk about is we're going to talk about just a little bit um, about the IRB. And then we're mostly going to talk about the training that's available for it. Um, there's a, um, a thing here. The second page has um, the address to go for the, um, the city training. It's got just the basics you need to know. And then we'll go over some specific details. Uh, what is the Institutional RB Board? It's the committee responsible for the conduct of human subjects research conducted at UTK. It's made up of faculty, non-scientists, legal counsel, and community representation. Can I just ask, is there a place on the website where they list the members? Yes, there is. There is? Yeah, okay. so it's, it's, I've got their website listed in here, and if you go there, I know it has dates of all of the IRB <coughs> meetings. I think it has the members. I swear to the I haven't spent hours and hours, but I haven't seen it yet. Oh, really? You haven't seen it? Okay. No. Um, maybe it's confidential. I wouldn't think so. But you can ask. Yeah. Well, since okay. we're public, probably not. But you can ask Brenda. Okay. Um, definition of human subjects is a living individual. Brenda gets calls from people who wants to know if they use people from the bodies from the body farm, whether they have to do an IRB protocol. And no, you don't. If you're using dead people, <laughs> you don't have to do an IRB protocol. <clears throat> um, how do you know what constitutes research with human subjects? It's a systematic investigation designed to Contribute, develop or contribute to generalizing the knowledge and um, has a little bit of explanation here what generalizable is. Um, that it's a collection of information from the scientific community knowledge to be used outside the institution. If you are only going to um, do your research and present it only within UT, you may not have to do an IRB protocol. But if you think that you're doing it for a class presentation and that you might ever want to publish it or use it in a poster session somewhere or anything like that, you should go ahead and get your IRB protocol because it's a lot easier to do that than it is to go back and try to get it later. One related question, because I've seen variations across the university. Mm -hmm. If we ask our undergraduates to do a small research exercise as part of the class, what is the UT's IRB position on that? It depends on whether they're ever going to use it for anything outside the university, whether it's a poster session somewhere, mm -hmm. a conference, um, they're going to use it in their thesis or dissertation work. I'm talking about undergraduates. Yeah, okay. Well, then they, if they're just still an undergraduate when they're doing this, <laughs> Um, they shouldn't have to, but it, you know, it really depends on what their purposes are for the research. Sure. If they're going to use it when they go to grad school and they want to use that data, 
um, they have to go ahead and do the IRB. Because the IRB forms need to be done before any data collection. Research. 
which is yet another course that takes about six hours. Um, <laughs> And it is a protected site, so you have to register. If you're already registered, you can just log in again. Um, why do you need it? Because it covers the ethics of research with human subjects in the biological and the social behavioral sciences. Um, the IRB, the one, the basic one for social behavioral sciences, has 21 modules. Each one can take from five, ten minutes, generally, maybe a little longer, depending <coughs> on how much you need to read and how much you already know. And there's a short quiz at the end of each module, four or five questions, and you need to pass each one with an 80 or higher. Um, although I have had some people pass a couple of modules with lower than that. I think one passed or got a 70 and got a 50 on another one of his. And it still showed him as passed. So if you get a notice that you can't go on until you pass it, then you have to retake the quiz. And you can take it, I think, as many times as you need to pass it. Um, at the end of when you completed everything, all the modules, required modules, then there's a set of elective modules, and there's a set of optional modules. Now you do have to pick a couple of the elective modules, but you do not have to do the optional ones unless you want to. They don't count towards the completion of the course. And when you're finished, you will see a link to print out your completion report to, test, to certify that you've completed all the modules uh, required by the institution. And um, then we've got some pictures on, some screenshots <coughs> of how to start. Um, the registration, the, the whole city website just changed the 1st of August, so if anybody's been in there and seen it before, it looks totally different. Um, so the, the first part, go into, uh, up at the top, there's a, an area that says register, right next to the login, or you can create an account, which is the same thing, which is down below the login information. So that's your first screen, <coughs> and um, the registration process is, you know, it takes you a few minutes, but you've got to put quite a bit of information in there. Um, the first thing you have to do when you get into register is you have to choose an institution to affiliate with. And you must affiliate with the University of Tennessee Knoxville. There are several UT campuses that have city training accounts, but they don't have necessarily the same training that UTK does. And you're welcome to affiliate with any institution you want, but it may not be what you need. And um, I will not have access to your records. So if you lose it, you lose your cheat, your completion report, I can't get at it. You'll have to log back in and yourself and get a copy of it. So again, it's very important to select the University of Tennessee, Knoxville. Yeah, um, I actually completed the city training at WU. Mm -hmm. um, <coughs> would that you would still want, if it, I hadn't taken the previous one, you'd still want me to register under UT and Um, No, where did you say you took it from? At WU. Okay, if, if it's been less than three years, it's fine. Okay. You can use that one. <laughs> yeah, if you've taken it at any other city institution, um, you can use it again as long as it's been less than three years. Okay. Yeah. So you don't have to take it when you change institutions okay. unless it's been more than three okay. years. And city will tell you if it's been. Yeah. Yeah, you can, you can use it if you've done it somewhere else. Um, the next page of the registration is to enter your name and email, and we would like you to use your UTK email address. 
Um, would you keep a database of this information? And in case there's a problem, we would like to have your UTK address. Um, then it'll ask you for a secondary email. That can be a Gmail account, Yahoo, anything, any other email you want. But the primary one should be your UTK if you are at UTK. Um, screen three is create your username and password. And you can use any username you want. You, can, you don't have to have your UT username. You can make up whatever. Um, and your password, and in case you lose your password, you've got to fill out a security question so they can come back to you and say, what's the answer to your question? Um, and I have had, lately I've had three people who got stuck on the, um, where you put in your email address. They were not allowed to go to the next screen and we have no idea why. It's only happened to three people. Um, if you experience anything like that, send me an email. I can make your account for you and send you your username and the password I used, and then you can go in there and change whatever you need, change your password, change any information. But I've had to do that for a couple of people. Um, because it will let them continue in the registration process for some reason. It stops them at their email, and we don't know why. Um, under the registration required information, everything that's marked with a red asterisk needs to be completed. Um, your department, your net ID, um, your UT email address, your role in the research, whether it's a PI or a co-PI or student, um, whichever you need to select your role. And when you list your department, please put the full department name. Because I get acronyms, and I know a lot of them, but I don't know all of them, and so I have to go and change everything. Um, so if you could put your whole department. Like if you are in BCMB, put biochemistry and molecular biology or whatever that stands for. Your role can change something. I mean, I went in and registered last week. Uh -huh. And, you know, I could be a co-PI on this proposal and a PI on the next one. Just, um, yeah, this is for your overall registration. Yeah, that's why it's strange so, so just pick one. <laughs> okay. Pick one. <laughs> <laughs> um, and you also will have to select um, whether you are a student, a faculty member, um, something else. But there's a, a drop down list of roles to select from. Um, then, after you've done all the registration, you will be asked to select the curriculum that you want to take. And question one is, um, the options for human subject research, so that's the one you want. And a lot of people get confused between question one and question three. And they'll do question three and then find out that they have to do question one for their protocol, and they'll get real upset because it takes several hours to do each course. So make sure you're doing the right course for um, your IRB protocol. And these are the other courses that we have. But Q1 is the one you want. And you'll go in there and you'll select the version that is most appropriate for your discipline. Um, then there's also one for students conducting no more than minimal risk research. So if you're just doing an interview, um, then you should be able to do the, um, the one for students. But if you're going to get into any more of the details, uh, any more higher risk, you should go ahead and click on the social and behavioral um, option. It 
goes into a lot more depth on the ethics. Um, so you select one of those. And this one's kind of hard to read, but it says select course options, and it shows you what the page looks like. And you just put a little click on whichever one is appropriate. You can only select one at a time. Um, if you want to add, add like two human subjects options, you can go back and add a second one later. But at the beginning, you can only select one. OK, what do I do now? Um, you enter the, your selected course site, and there'll be a list of required um, elective and optional course modules. And you click on the first module to begin. I think you have to read the integrity assurance statement first, and then it'll let you start with the modules. Um, the end of each module, there's a short quiz, like I said, and if you don't pass the quiz, you can take it again. When you are finished with all the required modules and taken the quizzes, you sh will get a um, block on the, the far um, right that says you passed it, and the date. If it doesn't have a pass date in there, it will say started or there won't be anything at all. Um, and the next two, the, the pass block, there will be a link for you to print out your completion report. And that's what you need to keep. And that's what has to go along <coughs> with your protocol. So, if you're listed on the protocol and your advisor is listed on the protocol, both of you need to have the training and submit um, your completion report. Everybody who's named on the protocol. Yes? You know, for those who, uh, who plan to do research that don't relate it to research subject, that means they fill the form A. Uh -huh. Whether they need the training? Yes. Oh my God. For every IRB protocol, starting in August of last year, every single IRB <coughs> protocol that goes through the UTK Office of <coughs> Compliance, yeah. uh, everybody named on that protocol has to have a trade. Because I thought that the, the Form A, that is a responsibility of, of the department level. Right. And so there's a no research subject, there's a no review, there's an only certification. Right. Um, you know, I haven't asked Brenda of that, so I'm not sure. So that's a question yeah. to uh, send her an email or call yeah. her and ask her and then let your students know because I'm not sure. Okay. okay. Um, if, it's, if it's exempt and it's on the form A yeah, and it only exempt. gets approved by the department, yeah. uh, I'm not sure. And I'll okay. give you the wrong answer. I'm inclined to say yes, that you still need it. <coughs> But I, I don't know. Okay, I, I rejected the brand. Yeah, check with Brenda. Yes, does that need to be stapled every time or just one? I first think time? just the first time oh. that you do one. So. Um, if Brenda needs it again, she'll contact you. Do we need to do, do the people that have had previous um, certifications mm -hmm. here at UT need to complete this also? I think you mean if you've taken the Blackboard course? Yes. And I bet that will do. Okay. Okay. Yeah. We stopped using Blackboard because we needed to collect more information on those students than what Blackboard collects. Oh. Okay. So the student who completed the Blackboard course last year, mm -hmm. whether they have to do it again if they want to fill Form B? No. Okay, good. Yeah. Um, it's fine as long as you've done either the Blackboard or the city training oh, within okay. the past yeah. three years. Okay, good. So we just recently stopped using Blackboard oh, okay. because we need to collect like department and net IDs and uh, email addresses and Blackboard doesn't do that. And so it's been good for three years, right? It's been good for three years. Okay. Either the Blackboard or the city one oh, okay. good for three years from the date that you completed it. Okay. Um, 
Okay. Again, a copy of the completion report has to accompany your protocol. But Brenda, um, I think she keeps copies if you've already done one, so you may not have to do it again. It just will be a checkbox that she can check off. But just double check with her. Um, when you get into your course, there is, um, it'll just tell you to pass it. You have to complete 21 required modules and one of the four elective modules and achieve an average score of 80%. <coughs> um, there are, like I said earlier, there are also like five or six optional modules that you can take, but they're not necessary and they don't, don't count towards your grade, your ultimate grade. And here are just a few of the modules um, for the social, I think this is for students doing no more than minimal um, risk research. And there are some of the same modules between the different uh, course options like biomedical, social behavioral students. They may overlap in modules, but then there's also some different ones. So it just depends, but each, each course in the IRB probably has at least 21. Um, there is an option for if you are doing, let me see if I've got it in here. Um, if you're doing just data and not, no, ident no identifying information, that's an option. Um, but that means that you will have no contact with your subjects that you're just using data on human subjects. And you can add more, per more courses or learner groups if, say, you're, you've taken the uh, course for students and your professor wants you to go take the one for biomedical. You can add that. Um, you just select the um, the menu under my learner tools. And you can remove your affiliation if you happen to be accidentally affiliated with another organization. You can remove it. Um, so, um, and then if you want to add a course, say you, you finish the IRB course and your professor wants you to also complete the Responsible Conduct Research course. You can add that um, just by clicking on that link. It'll come up with a list, again, that you picked from in the beginning. And um, you just pick whichever options you want. If you want to take all of them, well, good luck to you. <laughs> uh, but you can take as many of them as you need. Um, just use that link. May I ask a question? Yes. Generally, you know, if a person just thinking about doing research and then do the question one, mm -hmm. and later on they apply when from the National Association or Human um, uh, Health Department. Right. And at that time, they need to have the question three. Whether they can later on pick the, the question three after they already finished question one? Yes. Um, yeah. You just um, you don't have to select everything at the first at the okay. beginning. You just select what you're interested in because if you select, say you select all of them, you select COI and you select export control, they're all going to show up on your list of courses, and you can't delete them. Um, so pick what you want. Otherwise, you're going to have a bunch of stuff on here that will just be blank. No, I, I just mean that. Six months later. Mm -hmm. right? Okay, I can add it six months later. Mm -hmm. okay. At any time, okay. you can, there's also a link, I'm just not sure where it is in the new um, page, but you can also affiliate with another institution. 
So say you're working on an NIH grant and they require NIH training. You can go into affiliate with another institution and from the drop down list you pick National Institutes of Health. No, I think on the first page National Institutes of Health is one of the main ones. Um, or if you are going to be working a protocol with another institution and uh, they want you to take their IRB training, then you can go to that institution's website because every institution can have slightly different uh, requirements. Um, so you can you can add inst uh, you can affiliate with different institutions and you can add courses at any time. And if you want to see a report for your courses, whether you're finished with them or not, you would click at the top, there's a button called My Reports. And you select which institution you want your reports for if you're affiliated with more than one. And it will show you the curriculums that you have registered for, and it will show you your status. And if you passed it, it will have under a completion date, completion date that you passed it. And at the very end, it says completion report. If you finished it, there'll be a link there for you to click on, and that will pull up your completion report. And that's what needs to go with your protocol. And be sure to log off. Um, if you forget to log off, City will automatically do it in 20 minutes if there's no activity. Um, so if you are doing something and you wander off and forget, don't log off, if you're gone very long, City will log you off. Um, it will remember your place. So <coughs> if you are in the middle of a <coughs> module and you have to do something else, you just want to stop. When you log back into City, it will remember where you were, where you left off. Um, and oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, so I was just checking out the, the timing of this. So you're making it sound like if anybody you say is going for this fellowship application, which is due in November, to have it run through UT's Office of Research, they would have to complete this. The NSF rules are that. If you're approved in order to accept funding, you have to have IRB approval. So it um, doesn't sound like you're in sync with that. Is that correct? Okay, say that again. I'm not sure I understood. Are you requiring IRB approval at the moment of application for research funding? Not when you're applying for funding. Well, what do you mean when you refer to a protocol? When you submit your. Um, you're ready to, to submit your IRB protocol, which doesn't necessarily have to be at the same time you're funding it. There's something okay. that you can, on your um, what's it called? on your main registration sheet for your funding for your grant, there'll be a, an option to choose um, the protocol, and there's something called JIT, which is just in time, and when you get awarded the um, the Before grant. you get any funds. Definitely. Right. And you have to have that protocol into Brenda before you start any data collection. But it does give flexibility because this is a five or six hour process. What? To, to go training? Through, to go through 20 some modules. Yes, it is. Yeah. yeah, it's several hours. I mean, I've had people say they've completed it in two hours, and I've had other students say it's taken them seven. So it just depends um, on how much you already know and how closely you read it. <laughs> okay. Yeah, right. um, okay. In terms of when I have some experience with working on brand, once you receive the award, even before you start to collect your data, mm -hmm. if you want to use the money from the brand, you need to have IRB approval before you can use any money. Yeah, I think that's good. Yeah. yeah. But, yeah. but to, to, 
Students, in order to say to meet a deadline in six or eight weeks, do not have to do this by that. No, deadline. just select um, on your your proposal um, documentation when you fill it out. Check. Um, there'll be check boxes for human subjects, animal subjects, and export control. And I think under human subjects, there's a couple of options. Um, it'll ask you for your protocol number if you've already done it. Or you can select JIT for just in time. And then you just have to have your proposal approved before you can start anything. Before right. you can get any money and before you can start. Um, and again, NIH, I don't think they require that you use, that you affiliate with them um, to do a grant with them, but you might want to just to be sure that you've got what they need. Um, but they, up at, you know, they've always allowed this, so there shouldn't be a problem. Um, again, you must take the order, the modules in the order that they are listed. You can't jump around from module to module have to do them in order or it won't let you continue. And if you need more assistance, if you need anything on the IRB, uh, your protocol, specific instructions, anything related to the IRB except for training should go to Brenda. And she is extremely helpful. She will work with you as long as you need. And that woman has more knowledge about IRB than anybody I've ever seen. Um, and then if you've got training questions on the city courseware or any other training um, that the Office of Research offers, you can contact me. And then there is a compliance website link down there, which it's just the main um, web page for compliance, and it has all the different compliance areas. So if you're doing an IRB protocol, but you also need biosafety training, there's a link for biosafety as well. So there's a link on there to each area of compliance that you can go directly and find out who you need to contact for that. Um, and that's all I've got, unless y'all have some more questions. Um, again, Brenda and I are both always available for questions. You can call, yes? Um, do we have to get, our, do we have to have our uh, thesis or dissertation proposals written and defended before we get IRB approval or No, you have to before you defend it, before you can collect any data you have to get the IRB approval, or you can't use that data. Okay. But if you don't have data in your proposal, what do you do? Does that answer your question? Yeah. 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 Um, always, 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 you have to do the IRB before you can collect any data, or your data will not be able to be used. And I think I said earlier, if you're doing um, human subjects research for just a class presentation, but you think that at some point you might want to use it because your data is really great and you might want to use it later um, for thesis work. Um, it's better to go ahead and get the IRB protocol even though you think it's just going to be used on campus uh, because that, then you don't have to to wait and then try and go backwards because it's a lot harder to get approval to use data that was collected without without it earlier. So the best thing to do is just um, do the protocol if you think there's any way that you're going to use that data outside the institution. Yes? Uh, this is actually maybe for all three. I'm not sure if you're going to cover this in the last part, but is there a standard uh, language for informed consent forms, other forms. There are, yes, that, there are, yes, and they're, they're on. We're going to talk about. <coughs> and they're they're on the website. Okay. 
um, instructions and everything for doing those, all the forms, they're on the website at that irb.ubk.edu. And it would be in the forms. Um, there are the specific forms that you have to print out and fill out. There's also information sheets. There's examples of an assent form, that kind of thing. So you can just print those out and attach it to your protocol. Yes? Oh, no. Oh, okay. And there, there's a checklist of the documents needed because I'm, I'm not going to be able to stay the whole time and I just see all these like checklists, but it's unclear if that's a document or if that goes into a particular document. Can I document. say that? Because I haven't seen I think this is the other gentleman. I think it's just, they have like a checklist just to make sure before you turn everything in. Probably. But if you just, I don't yeah. Actually, yeah, you don't have to turn that part in. No, I don't think you do. Yeah. I don't think you do. It's just a help for Yeah, I mean, oh, if you yeah, want to, it won't hurt anything. I'm saying when you're turning in your packet of everything you need to turn in right. to go yeah. into review, like, have to form consent, you know, one document that this is what it will look like when I give it to my respondent. Mm -hmm. That document that's a proposal of it. Like, right. Like, it's their checklist of, like, I need these four documents, our forms to help out to turn it. Yeah, that, that, that would be very helpful. Yeah. That would, I don't know that Bermuda requires it, but it would be very helpful, especially if it has I to go. Oh, no. I, I don't think that I they don't use it. There's, but I think there is, there's what they call a review checklist. Yeah, I mean, yeah. you yeah. use it by yeah. yourself. Yeah. 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 Not that. Yeah, that's just, from someone coming from a different institution, I don't know every, all the reviews forms I need to fill out exactly. So like, okay, that form, I have that form, I have that it's form. Right. That's so, so. If I'm just checking, I can send it to you in the email. Yeah. Okay. yeah, but all of those things, um, should, <coughs> including in your checklist, are listed on the forms. Under forms. Under forms, so Under forms so when you go into the compliance area. Again, this FAQ is pretty helpful if you're not familiar with doing human subjects because it tells you kind of, is this human subjects and what else you need to do. So again, it's just from class presentations that Brenda has given. Um, we try to put something together. Um, so, any more questions?
They said that when you do research in uh, the area outside the United States, you have to follow the rule in the United States and the rule over there. Right. Yeah. So you have to check the rule over there and comply with all of the requirements in the area that you do research. Yeah, and I've done that before. Like yeah. Kenya, for example, has really strict research yeah. guidelines. That's exactly. But Uganda doesn't. But I was just asking what from UT's institutional side, if they require something separate for the fact that they have faculty or students that might be going abroad to collect data. Um, if I, I don't know for sure, but ask Darren. Like I said, it's better to ask. Um, again, all of our compliance officers are just wonderful. They will help you. They're all extremely knowledgeable. Um, they're always available. And you should be able to get anything you need. But if you are going overseas, check with Brenda and she'll let you know, and then you can check with Darren and see what you have to do. Um, because it just kind of depends on where you're going, again, because there's some countries that you can't go to. Like Cuba, I mean? Or, um, well, people can go to China, so they can probably go to Cuba, but there's other like high-risk areas. Probably right now, Syria is not some place you'd want to go. Like when you say you can't go to, do you mean that UT doesn't allow it or the right. federal government doesn't allow it? Um, the federal government does not allow it. They'll put out um, warnings. Yeah, right. So it depends on where you're going. But again, Brenda um, is the best person. And if you still have questions after her, she'll tell you to contact here. Okay. Well, thanks so much. I think we're going to move on to the third sure. part of today. Well, thank you all. And again, if you have any questions, <coughs> call me. May I check this is the first thing It is the first thing I've ever Okay. Yeah. Okay. Do it. 
Because if you say that you finish at that time and they terminate, you cannot continue your research project. Okay, so just put, you know, uh, longer than you need, just in case you should need it. And then now, objective of research project, you know, generally you have a proposal, just take something in your proposal and put it right there. Okay, and then um, subject, you use a secondary data. Just explain that you use a secondary data. However, describe what the data look like. Okay, describe what the data look like. You know, you, you indicated just that like in my case, I use a uh, data from Ethel, uh, and the data to involve how many cases, and indicate that all of those cases, no identifiable information will be available to make sure that people cannot know who in the data. We want to have that information written to make sure that you use a second degree data. There's a no information about the, the case that you can uh, review uh, the person. And the method or procedure, you know, generally uh, you just, you know, describe um, how you uh, analyze the data briefly. Uh, if you use a second, a different set of data, uh, describe how you merge these data together. Sometimes, in case you merge data, the, the identification of the research subject might be revealed. And so you have to describe the data that you use and the method, how you use it, how you analyze it, even though they may not know about your <coughs> study, but you need to have that information. And then category for exam research, and then here, you look at right here, and so I still need to use this one, and they have a number area. And uh, I think that you can look at oh, page. Here it is. What page? Uh, yeah. And so that means in the the in the, the bottom, yeah. The bottom, yeah. And you review, you read that, and you see what kind of exemption that you belong to, and then you put. The, the number in that. Can we go back to that? I think that we have a one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, yeah. Six category. And where do you and then that's it. And then now in front of the certification and I I I have a the problem the last time in terms of the chain of command. The first thing, you are you sign it. You are principal investigator, you sign it, and then you go to your advisor. Your advisor sign it, and then you go to me, or Dr. Mohan, the third, and then you go to the department head. Generally, last semester, all of the format I received Students go to the head first, the head's already signed and back to me. That is not the chain of command, appropriate chain of command. So please go to student advisor, to me, and then to the head. And from the head, you go to the research office, and that's the way. Because if the department has already signed, and if I want to change something, I cannot change. Right? And so please, go to the order that they put in here. Any questions on form A? Yes. In terms of filling out the city form, um, I know I would have to do it and attach it to this form, correct? And then my advisor would also have to take the... Unless they already said Okay, I think, I think according to the, I take the city course, but I think I have to take more than any others because I work as a chair, I am the chair. So I think that in the city, if you just want to use a secondary data, there's a, the, the section for that level. So you don't have to take more than that. But your advisor maybe have to take the whole thing. Okay. And so when you submit the form to me, Please give me a copy of your 
you know, the, the copy of, of the certification that you pass the course and your advisor also, okay? Questions? I always walk it over also. Yeah. Walk this, like walk the forms to her, to Brenda. Uh, yes. Yeah. Okay, yeah. yeah. But it means after the, the department already signed, yeah. and then from the department head, you go to Brenda. With your legs. Yeah, you go to Brenda. But generally, in this case, if the department IRB already signed, Brenda will approve it. That's it. Yes. Uh, well, at the very top, it said faculty should be co-PI, and then at the bottom, it just says PI and faculty advisor. So which is it? Okay, call BI for student project, lead student and the advisor. <coughs> yeah, I don't know. But uh, let's see, the department, ah, yes, you know, you, you, can, you can put, you can tie the student or whoever is a call the PI and then the call BI and then you put, you know, just like a faculty advisor, XYZ. Okay, the student ABC, yes. and then advisor XYZ. You just type, you know, the category under that line. Okay. Yes. So uh, we need our advisor signature, but we don't need any signatures from our thesis committee or thesis chair or dissertation chair? Okay, now, in the thesis or dissertation case, you will have the committee is the separate from the IRB. Okay. Okay. But the chair of the thesis committee or the dissertation committee will serve as the advisor for your research okay. because the last person will direct your research. Okay. Other questions for from A? Okay. So no question from A. We go to from B. Okay, so uh, can go a little bit. Yeah. Okay. So here and this one, there's a lot of confusion. Last time, the previous one investigator, <coughs> a co-investigator. That means who actually participate in a research project. Okay. And so if you uh, have a, even the last project, you are person responsible for the research, not your professor, class professor, okay, but faculty advisor will be the person who direct your research. And so last, last time I have a many of uh, the graduate students uh, who, uh, who try to do a research project, class project, but later on want to publish and put the name of the professor as the principal investigator. That is wrong. Okay, you are the principal investigator. Your professor will be faculty advisor because the faculty advisor will direct you to do research. And also remember, when you fill any form A or B, the principal investigator will be responsible for all of the security measures. And in many forms that I reviewed last time, in the description of responsibility for security measure. Only students have a responsibility, but the, 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 the principal investigator, means the professor, has nothing to do, and that is not right. So the, if you want to put the professor as a principal investigator, that okay. That is your decision and your professor decision, but who serves as the principal investigator will be responsible for all of the security measures. Okay? Is it clear? Okay. So form B is just if you're going to a full review? No, there's a two kind of uh, expedite yeah. and full. Okay? So you have to do form B regardless. Yeah. Full <coughs> we have a five members so of the company. If you're in interviews, you're going to need form B. But and you might go. Form A is only it's for only like secondary data. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Form B, they have a two level. Expedite well, and pool. Expedite, you have a two <coughs> member review over there. Pool five members. Okay, so <coughs> two member two <coughs> review is faster than five. Okay. So I can still Okay. 
But if you in the if if your subject involves children, all of the people that I just said, pregnant women, minority, prisoners, people under correctional supervision, you go to full review. Okay? <coughs> now the second project classification. Now, we already know your dissipation, you have to do it. But if you just want to do the class project, you don't have any intention to present it later on outside the university, you don't have to do it. Okay? So think about that. If you don't, because last time I review about five, and then finally four, the citizen said, oh, I don't want to, I just want to do the, 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 the glass project. And so if you want to do the glass project, you don't need to, to fill the form. Okay? Only when you want to publish, or to present at a conference, uh, or later on you have intention to do it outside the university, and then you have to do it. And then the next, the title, whatever you want, the starting date, generally you can put upon IRB approval. So whenever you have approval, you can start right away. Okay. And then the estimate completion date, as I already indicated, you can put it longer uh, than needed. And then external run of funding, whatever you want to have that, that's it. And then, okay, and then what else? Uh, according to my... Only now we're two and three. Oh, uh, yeah. Okay, so now uh, Laura can talk about... I'm part two and three. Um, project objectives. Um, a lot of this you can actually find a, um, they actually have a form B that has guidelines. Additionally, I didn't put it up here, but it'll actually go through it of what you need to include in each particular section. Um, but your project objectives, um, it's your rationale. And then what you want to get out of it need to be clear and accurate objectives for your research. The significance of your proposed research, what it's going to do for the field. Um, if you have letters of support, um, you'll need letters of support saying if you want to do interviews in a prison or in some other educational institution or something like that. You actually have to have letters of support from them to include with this in order uh, for exposure. It gets kind of complicated, um, especially when the institution may want your IRB approval prior to giving you a letter of support, but you need a letter of support and you're, you're kind of fighting back and forth in that instance. But that is literally laying out objectives. Um, with mine, I actually included number of objectives, um, and, and those are things to really lay it out very clearly um, as to what I was really going for and what the goals were. Um, and then description and source of um, participants. Dr. Bowie and I talked about how specific you really need to be. How, you, how are you gonna obtain that sample? Um, what are the demographics and characteristics of that sample? Why do you choose who you're going to choose? How are you going to recruit them? Um, how do you initiate that? Um, for my dissertation, um, it ended up kind of being a snowball, talking to certain people, getting other um, individuals kind of feeding to others. So you actually list whom you're going to contact first and how you're going to build on any type of sample or if you have um, a sample that you're just going to randomly draw. If it's on campus, how are you going to promote that? How are you going to recruit? Are you going to include flyers, which you'll need to put with that, those kind of things. Um, criteria for selection and exclusion, who you would include, who you would exclude, who could participate. Um, number of participants is also important. The number of anticipated participants to really lay that out. Um, they want you to also identify any incentives if you're going to give like a gift card or any of those kind of things for participation. You have to include that in there also. And then disclose any relationship that you may have to any of the participants. Um, especially if, you're at, if you were going to do something with students and you had some sort of relationship with them, uh, professor, student, those kind of things. Um, and then of most importance, the characteristics of the sample that could raise concerns for human research. So what about this particular population may be vulnerable, how you're going to address those things, what kind of risks um, those individuals could face, how you're going to address that, which, you know, it'll come back later um, for uh, risk and protection measures, but just kind of reiterating those kind of things. Um, and online, uh, I literally 
bolded, italicized. There aren't any victims that I'm going to interview, those kind of things. If, if you really um, don't have um, super vulnerable populations, you're trying to get it through expedited, you want to highlight um, what about that should allow it to be expedited and not go to a full review. Anybody else have any thoughts on those two parts, questions on those two?
uh, specific risk and protection <coughs> measure. After you describe all of those, you have to realize that when you do that, there's any potential risk caused to people to participate in your study. And then after you realize that there's a risk, and then propose something that you want to do to minimize the risk, because the risk can cause when you collect the, info, the, the, the information that is considered as private information. There's a risk that you release that information or to disclose that information to other people. And then you have to describe how, uh, what kind of measure you use to protect all the information, not to disclose to other people, not to, you know, not to other people, but only by yourself and other in the research project. And so that you have to describe all of those. And then uh, the benefit. Yes. Uh, any questions before we move to benefits? Any questions about? Uh, and you know, I think that I have a more problem with the specific risk and protection measure. You need to describe in the concrete term. Uh, cannot just say, you know, I will protect at the uh, you know highest level, but I don't know what kind of uh, what is the highest level. What you have to do, you know, just like uh, you need to keep. Uh, the data in the drawer uh, with the lock. Uh, if you use a camera, where you put the camera uh, to prevent other people from accessing the camera and look at the picture, something like that, very, very concrete. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because they they like for you to have something locked, like yes. to be able to lock it up. And you know, there's also the issue that some of you indicate that you use, you put it into a drawer at home but how you have to describe how that drawer is safe. And so I suggest, I, mean, I suggest, if you work with the advisor, your advisor will access the data. And you can put the data in the drawer in your advisor office with the key. You know, secure lock, you know, security lock drawer or something. And if you use a computer, you store the data. Describe how you protect the data from the computer, prevent other people from accessing the, the computer in order to access the data. Because all of us, we use the computer today, and you have to address all of those uh, issues. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Talk about benefits? Um, they want you to, to state the reasonableness of the risks that you have versus the anticipated benefits that you're going to have. If you have risks, explain why they're acceptable, how you minimize them. Um, again, state, reiterate if your risks are minimal, reiterate that and put that in there. Um, and then also for the benefits, the biggest part being that generalizable knowledge that she talked about, that, that you're adding to the knowledge of any particular field, of your particular field, those kind of things. And I also have, they actually have a sample informed consent um, yeah. for the next. Um, did you want to talk about that and I'll yeah, find an informed okay. consent? Okay. Uh -huh. You know, generally, um, sometimes if you work by yourself, in your project, there's only one principal investigator and then you have your advisor. And so uh, if the data can have a high level of sensitivity, and then you uh, only work in one person. If you just work in one person uh, with no advisor, and then you don't need to use the pledge of confidentiality to protect the data. However, if your data involved and the project involved two person or more, that means more than one person will know about the data. Then you need to have that one. And that one, make sure that uh, all of those who participate in the research project will, okay, and uh, will have to comply with all of the measures to protect the privacy and the confidentiality of the data. And so if you work in a group project, and the principal investigator will ask all of those who participate in the project to sign that form. Okay? And they have a form too for transcribers. There's a one. Yeah, I, I, don't, yeah I don't know, but I. Yeah, but, 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 if you need one. Yeah. yeah. 
But this form, you just follow the form and sign it. Fill the name and sign it. You don't need to change anything. Okay. <coughs> uh, for informed consent, I'll just kind of go over. They actually do have a sample one that you can actually change yourself. It's a Word document. Um, just for informed consent, that will go to all of your participants. Um, you would have to mention in informed consent if you were going to give them a printed copy, if they were going to sign a printed copy, if they were going to verbally agree, if they had an assent form, if it's a child. Uh, you wish you would need the parents' assent for those kind of things. Uh, the purpose of your research, the procedures of what you're going to do, you need to tell them of the risks, tell them of the benefits, how you're going to protect their confidentiality, those kind of things. Um, process for obtaining if they get any compensation or treatment. If you know if something goes wrong and they need um, to talk to a counselor, those kind of things, you can include that for sure on campus if you need to. Has to have your contact information. It has to reiterate that it's voluntary that they um, participate in that. Um, those kind of things have to be locked up also um, because in that instance you can tell if they sign it who participated and who didn't, and you would need those um, on your informed consent. You can also include if they actually um, would allow um, their interview. If you're going to interview somebody, if they want it to be tape recorded, audio recorded, any of those kind of things, if they want you to be able to use their real name. You can include all, all of those things on that form also. And then they get an extra copy themselves, plus the one that they saw. <coughs> Questions about informed consent? Oh, and those um, have to be kept here at the university for three years by your advisor. Yeah, that means, you know, generally, uh, every, after one year, they, when they issue an approval, one year later, and they will check whether you will stay in the, uh, the study. The study already completed or still ongoing. And then uh, they will ask how many people you already interviewed in the last time. Give them, uh, you know, the, the copy of the, uh, I think that. They want a copy of your yeah. informed consent with you covering up the name of whoever signed yeah, it. So that's that's right. Yeah, they, 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 they want to have it. that. And if you want, I don't. I cannot remember. But we can block the name. Yes. Yeah, but they want the date. The yeah. 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 They want the date. But you have to keep that. They have a signature, but you can block the name. You know, uh, black out on the name, and then make a copy and, and send all of the copy to the research office, so they can check it. And you have to keep it into into. Uh, you have to keep it where you want. <laughs> In, in the safe thing, uh, place, three years after you complete the research project. Okay. Yeah, because they send you an email one year, yeah, like one, one year, year anniversary, and you only get one email. So they're not going to send you another one to remind you. And you have to send that in and send it to Brenda. Um, because, and then you only get one email telling you you're good to go, like after you complete that. Um, my thoughts for just be persistent. Keep going, especially if you're going to ask the government for something that you want. Um, I put in a FOIA request to the FBI in January of 2012. I have still not received my data. Uh, I'm in the queue. I'm getting there. It actually has somebody right there. Um, but I actually had to appeal and, and take that. I sent out three FOIA requests, got one that was mostly redacted, gray, blacked out sheets. Um, one I got projected even upon appeal, and on the third one I won my appeal. Um, so just be persistent and do it really, really, really far ahead of time um, because I can pull up the dates. Um, they only meet once a month. If you need full review, you have to have it in two weeks. Like if they meet on the 15th, you have to have it in by the first, or you have to wait for the whole next week. <coughs> then they decide you want it expedited, but they want full review. You have to wait till the whole next month to do it, and it takes a while especially if you need a full review um, for them to review in two, three, four months. It takes quite some time. Do you have a list you can see? Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're on their website. I can send them off to you. Also, you know, I, I just want to, to remind you that I work that as a service to the department. I also need time to review it. And so when you send it to me, Please to expect that I will review it within three weeks. I cannot review within one week. Okay? After I finish my review, I give you some of the recommendations to make change. You need to have a change, a time to make change, return back to me. 
and then I need another three weeks. Okay, just think about that. And then you go to the research office over there, and you need to wait at least one month. I expect to have one month in order to have approval. If everything is okay, if everything is not okay, they could send you uh, a comment and recommendation for change. You do a change to send them back, wait for another month. And so that's the timing issue that you need to consider. And I have to take about, you know, my experience in, I have a full review, uh, and I do the interview. It took me six months before I can get the approval. And so thinking about that, when you plan to do uh, your dissertation or your thesis or your, uh, you know, class project or whatever, okay? And so there's a... I put the dates up there. Yeah, the date that you can check, the date that they, they... But you have your application need to go there one week before the day they meet. So you can, you know, yeah, okay. Okay, so uh, the last thing in the form is the part about number... Okay, number nine, facility and equipment you use in the research. <coughs> we want to know what kind of equipment you use and what kind of facility you use in order to make sure that all of the data you collect from human subject will be protected. That's it. So you need to describe what kind of facility that you use. Uh, and if you use your private facility at home, you have to explain how you can protect the, 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 the data, the confidentiality of the data, and also equipment. If you use a computer, describe if it's your computer, the desktop, or the laptop. Uh, if you want to take the picture and describe what you use to take the picture, the camera, where to, where to put the camera after you take the picture. If you use the computer, how you can protect the computer. And so all of these measures want to make sure that the data that you collected from human subject will be protected and, uh, you know, and the privacy of the research project will be you know, uh, protected at the highest level. And uh, you know, that, that's all of the reason why we want to, to know about uh, facility and, and equipment. And many of you may not think about the just you, know, you use a paper and pencil, but actually you use a computer, and you use a research office, and you use your you know, home office, you need to describe all of those things. And then the responsibility of the principal and co-principal investigator, and then this is uh, the division of labor between uh, you know, people who participate in your research, your uh, co-investigator or you describe what you do with the data to make sure that all of the measures about protection subject will be, uh, you know, will be protected, okay? And all of here is about protecting human subject, protecting the confidentiality of the data. And we don't care about, you know, whether the research method is appropriate or not. That is not our responsibility. We just want to make sure that the data that you collected and the, uh, the human subject uh, involved in research will be protected. Okay, any other questions? Okay, so I think that we're out of time. <laughs>